Hello and welcome. Anyone who's been to Merchant City Yoga on a Sunday knows how much I love catching up with everyone over a cup of my freshly brewed spiced chai. These Sunday chai sessions really bring everyone together. A true celebration of friendship, community and connection. I want to try and capture some of that magic and share it with you at home. So I've invited some familiar faces from our MCY family to chat with me over a cuppa. I'm affectionately calling them the chai sessions. Pop the kettle on, get yourself comfy and come and join us. So thank you for joining me for this, unbelievably, my 20th chai session here at MCY. So it's super special for a couple of reasons. Here in person, Ooh. and I've got <laughs> Emma back with me as well, Yay. first return guest for the chai session. Oh my goodness, and it's so handy because I'm like here all the time. Yay! And we have our <laughs> cup ready. So before we get into chat about Yama and Niyama, which is what we're here for, I um, do want to, to say a couple of things um, that we both fully appreciate, that although we're going to talk about um, yama ni yama, we are taking them a little bit out of context that when they appear in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra they are in an order and they're in that order for very good reason and you know the idea is that I guess that you, you study them, you approach them in that order as well completely appreciate and understand as well that they're all interrelated, they're all interconnected and each yama ni yama um, is influenced by all the others and in turn influences all the others as well. So having said all of that, what I've done is invited Emma here today to chat about our three favourite Yama and Yama. And what we've done is we've not told each other uh, the three that we've picked. And like I say, we will be talking about them out of order, out of sequence. Um, but just trying to make it maybe a little bit more light-hearted and giving us a, a jumping off point for the conversation. So, do you want to go? So I also want Oops. to caveat it yeah, a wee yeah. bit, is that like the notion of having like a favourite yama ni yama is... Oh yeah, like having a favourite yoga posture. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I do have favourite yoga <laughs> postures. The, the favourite yoga posture is more, but in the same way a posture and a yama ni yama, it changes with the season of your life. Hmm. because none of the things the postures or the or the principles in these things are of themselves they are there to reflect you back at yourself you know so it's like when you do the posture we know especially if you do ashtanga yoga how it's different every day because you're you're different in that posture every day your body is different and in the same way um when you do the philosophy when you do it which is this is it not when you study it but when you live it you can feel that mm, like different bits like pop up and shine and like become relevant to you mm. depending on what's going on for you and so like the three that I have chosen to talk about today are ones that kind of out of like if I like to I'm thinking about them like jewels and I think I stole that idea from Deborah Adele um, but I really like it because it, this notion is that they have different facets and also, it's like I have my little jewellery box of, of things that I, I'm aware of and I have in my kind of practice toolkit. And like one of them will glint at me in a new way, you mm -hmm. know? And so that's kind of like these are the ones that are glinting at me right now. Yes, um, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, because of like what is happening in my life and what I need uh, reflected back at me, like the, on this particular moment. And that doesn't mean that all the other ones aren't still in my box and still in daily use. Absolutely. This is a very extended metaphor, as I like to do. Mm. Uh, but uh, it means that, um, yeah, I mean, these are the ones that are kind of relevant to me right now. So do you want me to say my first one? Okay, so... Um, or I'll go first if you want. All right, yeah, sure thing. I don't mind, because I've got notes. I have notes, but just not... They're okay. metaphysical. So, <laughs> but that's because you talk about this a lot, a I lot more a lot. Yeah. in classes and in the public domain yeah. and than I do. And, and I just want to tell everyone as well that I wasn't the one that during my teacher training had a page limit <laughs> on my yoga philosophy essays. Let's just say June didn't have to go there with my philosophy essays. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, you know. So you're you're steeped and Yeah, very much so. It's very much part of your vocabulary. Yeah. Whereas it's not so much part of my vocabulary. Mm-hmm. Although it's part of my practice, it's not so much my vocabulary. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. words um, yeah, that yeah, I'm yeah, looking yeah. for here. And and also I've brought along um, some of the books that I use as well, just that we can have a wee look yeah. at how they translate. Oh, wow, well, yeah. No, so, yeah, that is fun. Yes. So the first one I brought is a paragraph. Mm. Yes. So this is the one that's usually translated as non-greed um, or mm-hmm. abstention from greed or hoarding. Mm-hmm. The one I really quite like is the the idea of like not coveting because mm-hmm. um, I think that that brings another nuance to it but the reason I picked this one oops the reason I picked this one was because back in those days when I was writing mm-hmm. the essays for the teacher training this was probably the first one that kind of made a little hint of sense so I'd never really um looked closely at any of the philosophical texts mm-hmm. uh, before I did the teacher training and so it's all quite overwhelming and quite mm. alien a lot yeah. of it and quite difficult to grasp as well it's so hard when you look at it all like in one yeah, splash and, you're and just that, like oh my that gosh. kind of vastness so this was one of the first ones that I went oh actually that makes a little bit of sense and mm-hmm. like all of the other stuff we're going to go on and talk to like your first impression is completely different from mm-hmm. what you think of now and it's like I like your dual analogy because that implies that there's depths that you can't see 100%. and that you haven't seen yet and, and all of that stuff as well so obviously the more you look at it the more there is but that's why I picked this this one mm. as my first one because it was the first one that I kind of cool mm, maybe mm. can kind of see how that might and so what was it for you that you were not coveting and was it like things or or like what does it mean for you personally? What was it at the time? Um so it was it was talking to not looking outwards for happiness and satisfaction mm-hmm. and not looking to other people for a sense of achievement mm. or an idea of I wanted to be where they were. Mm-hmm. Um, Deborah Adele, I know we, we talk about yeah. this book, really nice introduction to the Yama and Yama, very mm-hmm. accessible. What she says about it is, um, a parigraha invites us to let go and to pack lightly for our journey through mm-hmm. life, all the while caring deeply and enjoying fully. So I think when we start reading the, the philosophy as well, there's a lot of talk of, non-attachment and detachment and all of those kind of things which is a, a sounds, separate conversation scary yeah, yeah. but what um, i liked about her description was that sense of packing lightly but having packed lightly doesn't mean that you don't experience everything in its fullness i like to can i say what i think about a paragraph yeah, yeah is that okay yeah. this is a conversation um, so i want okay. to you <laughs> is that, yeah. all right um so i actually a paragraph was like my favorite one when i was doing the teacher training too um, but for me, it was about um, my attachment to notions that I had to uh, adhere to. I mean, that sounds quite similar to what you're saying. Um, but like for me, it was more like like things that I had to do for myself. It wasn't coming from the outside. But so mm-hmm. for me, what really like sticks out in a parigraha is so there's this like graha is the grasping. Yeah. And, like pari is like you say all all around. So, like, you could be, like, grasping at all the stuff that you want around, and, like, that's maybe, like, the most literal and the easiest way in, in terms of concrete things. But um, for me, like, that is kind of easier to practice, is, like, letting go of stuff. Yes. And then the bit that's really, like, juicy and sticky is the bit of, like, the things that you really can't, that you are, you have your hooks into, or that they have it into you, is, like, the ideas that you can't, let go off of like I have to be successful or I have to be able to do this or I have yeah. to you know all of that and so like trying to practice like letting go and so like packing lightly is a nice image but I like to think of it as like because again a suitcase is something that you carry that you grasp yeah, and so it's something that you you have it with you but it's just like walking alongside you and it can come and go 
or like you could think about it as like like you're not holding it like this but you're holding it like this yeah with an open palm and then it can live mm. and change but that's scary because if you are attached to something because someone always told you that that's what you need then the idea of it changing is like Ugh. you know it's it's scary but I, the scary moments, like when you first started practicing, you're like, that's uncomfortable, I don't like it. And then in the same way that when we do a yoga posture, we like yoga postures that feel scary, like your TikToks and stuff like yeah, that. You're like, yeah. oh, it's fun. You know, <laughs> in the same way for me doing yama niyama or like practicing it in my life, finding the bit that feels a bit like, it becomes, it's not thrilling exactly, but I know that that's where I want to be because that's where the growth is. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah so it's and it's not like i might like, how much can you possibly let go of because that's already like that's again a competition but it's more like mm, can i just loosen the grip a little bit and see what space appears there for me yeah and it's space just to be here now because if you don't have to carry all your burdens you can just be you don't have to carry the things like literally the stuff like, what's the name of the guy, I always forget, in Dickens, who has to carry all his possessions? You don't remember. My mum always talks about it. I don't remember either. Mum, what, what's his name? <laughs> I don't know if you can watch this. Um, but anyway, it, the, in Dickens, there's this character who, once he dies, he, as his ghost, has to carry all the stuff that he had in his life behind him. Right. And so, like, because it's from this, like, Protestant, like, background of, like, you know be like ascetic and like don't have too much stuff kind of thing in the same way like what mental baggage are we carrying around with us that like burdens us and that doesn't allow us to enjoy and participate in life and our and relationships mm -hmm. and things yeah so i mean it's so we can talk for half an hour however more just about a paragraph on huh? on this yeah because the other aspect that wasn't a because I did my teacher training back 2005-2006 mm. so when I start to think about these things but more within the context of like current concerns and sensitivities within the yoga world and mm. the kind of the world in yeah. general I think this speaks a little bit to that as well um, in uh, Nikolai Bachman in the book that you were looking at just before um, he talks about this so in things like power dynamic mm. like the the power imbalance it's about not coveting someone else's power mm -hmm. and in that kind of same respect not taking power away from other people yeah. for um, yourself I jotted down another couple of said as well um the different points of view as well so this made me think about um you know, the narrative on social media somehow sometimes it's a little bit divisive just because it lacks nuance mm -hmm. and context yeah so then there's there a little bit about like grabbing the limelight the attention mm. the engagement yeah um without necessarily thinking about the the wider implications of that well it's an interesting like it's an interesting notion that you would grab the limelight that there's only so much to go around mm. you know and i don't really i mean less and less i feel that way and i think that's just like me having really worked on that is that I don't feel like someone else's success is going to take away from my mine or like I don't know I guess I'm just working on my own stuff but it's interesting that a paragraph then because it sounds if you think about grabbing someone else's something then it becomes close to asteia non-stealing mm -hmm. and then you're like oh so what is the boundary then and I find it really interesting like because there are some of them and like asteia and santosha have something in common santosha contentment um, and a paragraph these three are like they kind of look at each other yeah. from across the room and so then what why list them as separate items um so i think that like um for me anyway like asteya is certainly about uh, uh respect mm -hmm. you know and about boundaries and about not taking other people's things and a paragraha is more about even though they're both yamas so they're both about relationship with other people a paragraha is not is is about this the grasping and so it reminds me um of uh how richard freeman describes pratyahara which is like inward the inward turning inwards of the senses he translates pratyahara as not letting the senses like gr grip into things yeah you know um and again it's about that kind of hookness of it 
and like grr, you know, and like, uh-huh, there's definitely grasping. something for me about the coveting mm-hmm. of it as well. It's not just about greed or grabbing or grasping. It's actually mm-hmm. coveting it, yeah, um, as well. But I just think it's so cool that we can't talk about any one of the yama and yama without eventually starting to talk about the others as well. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a great jumping off okay. point for you Should to share your right. first. So my first one, I, I, the way that I was going to present the three is like kind of chronologically through the as they appear in the <laughs> thing. Just bounced about no, that's all fine. The yeah, I mean you've done it alphabetically <laughs> maybe. Um, so uh, even though Ahinsa is like the one, uh, I am going straight into the second one, which is Satya, which is well, what is it? How do you translate it? So I mean the the classic way of translating it is truth, um, or truthfulness. I don't really find truthfulness an interest, uh, like a useful. I chose this one too. Yeah, good. This because my, it's so good. This was my third one. All right. This okay. Cool. Third okay. Okay. Choice. Um, were they in like order of preference? So the way I framed it up yeah. was the one that first made sense. Oh, cool. All to right. Uh huh. The one that has probably changed the most in wow. my. Uh-huh. The way I think about it has changed the most since first meeting it yeah. to today. Uh-huh. And then my third one was the one that I've been thinking most about recently. Lately. The one that's kind of current oh, wow. for me. Okay, cute. So oh, that's I love how that. I kind of framed Okay, great. Well, then maybe I can say what I, why I like such a my and why it works. But that's amazing. I love that. <laughs> I mean, I just went through it kind of... Because I talk about them in order a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so I'll say... And also, I love Satya so much. And I'll tell you why. Um, so satya, truthful, truthfulness or truth, but it comes from this word sat, which I really love, which is like the real, <laughs> um, which is, it's not just like, like what is, I, I'm like, the word real is just so, I, coincidentally in my like group of friends from uni, the real was like, we use it to describe like an epic sense of like awesomeness. Um, <laughs> And so I used to take pictures of my yoga books and send it to them. We're like, dude, guys, it's the real. Anyway, um, uh, what is real is really hard for us to perceive. Mm. Uh, I'll say a word first of all, first of all about like truthfulness. You know, I kind of always found it like easy to tell the truth, probably because like when I was really young. I a couple of times like told lies and got into like so much trouble about it more than in any like even like it wasn't even about the bad thing I did but the fact that I lied about it mm. was like so bad so I was like burned by that and never tell a lie now um so that's like not so hard for me but for me it's hard what's harder is the truthfulness with yourself mm-hmm. which is partly the dialogue that you have with yourself what you're willing to look at in yourself and around you, what you're willing to accept, and thirdly, like what you can even see. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I chose Satya, uh, and probably as the first one, is that it feels like a bottomless practice because delusion is so pervasive and it's so, uh, like, because you don't know what you don't know, you don't know that you don't know the truth, if that makes sense. Yeah. Is that you think you know the truth, but you don't actually because you're still de- deluded by whatever and it what is. And what is the truth and who gets to decide what the truth is anyway? Well, yeah. And so, and then you have like, what is your truth? Uh, like people are always like, speak your truth. And, uh, you know, within the commentaries, actually, they talk about how satya must be practiced in the context of ahinsa. Yeah. So it's not yes. just like, this is what I think and so I'm going to say that. You know, that's not yeah. what it's about because um, it's truth within the context of relationality. And the thing is, actually, if you start to practice that and start to look at your what your truth is, um, if it tends to be harmful and hurtful to other people, you know, often, or if it's like unnecessary harmful or hurtful to people, then, you know, it often turns out that like your truth is not really so deeply considered and I'm being careful about saying that because um I don't want to just be like you know if it your opinion your opinion has to fall in line with other people's that's not what I mean because also sometimes saying an uncomfortable truth is by far the kindest thing absolutely and and being truthful isn't always 
comfortable or easy. It can be very, very, very hard. Yeah, but it's where that then meets harmful or hurtful mm-hmm. yeah. to whoever your truth. It can be, it can be, so like in my experience, it can be like something that I always thought that I was trying to be kind by not saying what I felt about something. Because I'm like, well, what do my feelings matter here? I'm just going to do what is important, ahinsa, the greater good, whatever. Yeah. But then I got a greater understanding that if I'm in a relationship with someone or in relationship with someone or reality, yeah. then the more I can show up fully as who I really am, the more our relationship can be built on a foundation of truth. Yeah. And, if it, and that's the only way that it can really go forward. If it's on this like sugarly ground of like some notions and some like idealistic concepts then it's gonna and it's gonna Mm. rupture um and so it means that the kinder more ahinsic (laughs) it's not a word the more ahinsa way of doing it is to actually show up with your truth and so they're mutually in fact yeah influential and also what you're talking about uh, so there's a couple of things there that that kind of jump out so what you're talking about there I find really interesting about Satya because there's movement in it. Yeah. There's there's a fluidity. There's a because flexi- reality is there's changing. There's a flexibility. So the truth in is it. changing. Uh-huh. Yeah. And and whether we're in relation, shit with ourselves or in relation to other people, there there has to be a dynamic movement with, mm. within mm-hmm. what we communicate as truth like in that moving together. And also the other thing is like. It's actually very difficult to talk about this without talking about the light and shade of ahimsa mm-hmm. as, yeah. as well. It's like they're so tightly yeah. um, woven in. So why that. is Satya for you like so relevant right now in particular? Um, so there's a, there's a couple of things. It's thinking about off the back of lockdown and the business and the mm-hmm. studio and mm-hmm. everything. Where, where do I want to go now with mm. the business? Mm. So kind of from a professional point of view, where do I want to go with the business? Mm-hmm. Um, what do I personally want to get out of it? What's my vision for what we're doing here? What do I mm. want to achieve? Um, so trying to kind of rootle around a, a little bit because tied up in that, there's an awful lot of what I think I should be doing yeah. and what I see other you can only do your own dharma Judy. you can't do other people's so, dharma <laughs> so yeah up in that and and there's a lot of self-inflicted pressure about what i set mm. out to do and what i think i should be doing and uh, so that's all just yeah. a big hot mess just now kind of because the last like three or four years have really been focused on survival yeah. like hitting lockdown it was like how, how do we stay this? afloat yeah. how do we keep this going coming out of lockdown right up until kind of towards the end of last year it was still very much yeah, yeah. survival mode mm-hmm. it's like doing whatever it takes just to to hang in there mm-hmm. but now things rightly are having to move and shift a little bit mm-hmm. um you know a recognition that for example i can't work for the next 10 years the way i've worked yeah. the last 10 years so how's that going to look and then button up against that kind of running into that is the kind of the personal practice thing as well. Mm. Um, yeah, that's so, oh my God, yeah, injury, you've had loads of such a stuff in there. Yeah, like around injury, and it's like, well, what am I practicing for? What what do I want to get out of this practice? And again, there's a lot of... And where is your body really at right now? Uh-huh, a lot of self-inflicted, well, I should be able to do this. Where is my credibility if I can't do that? You know, like all of that mm. whole conversation as well. And... Um, I know you picked out, so I brought this book, yeah. the Rama Prasada, James's favourite yeah. translation. And, you know... He, mm, he only likes it because he actually speaks Sanskrit like fluently and so it's yeah. fine for him. So that's great. <laughs> but um, when I was reading the translation in this, I totally loved it because he doesn't say truthfulness at all. Yeah. He says veracity uh-huh. instead of truthfulness and yeah. I was like okay yeah i love that word because yeah. it has a fear fierceness about yeah. it that truthfulness is it truthful 
is a little bit like, well, we're just not going to tell lies. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's why I hate the word truthful. But <laughs> veracity, especially given the context that I'm thinking about it just now, yeah. there's a fierceness mm-hmm. in that. And, you know, I think to, to definitely kind of all the cliche phrases, stand in your truth, know your truth, love your truth. Yeah, yeah. All of that takes a courage and a strength and a, a, million percent. And a fierceness. A million percent. And I so love it. I quite like for me just now mm-hmm. I actually quite like that yeah translation love that so much of it. Yes. that's the other thing why I like it because it feels like cold and uncompromising but in in the most like stable way truth um, I like sometimes I like to think about it as like authenticity yes. and um, sincerity. sincerity and integrity yeah. yeah and it's actually really difficult to make your decisions and choices based within those words of like, you know, sincerity and authenticity and truth. Mm. There's so many factors out there pulling on us. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the whole thing. Like if you think about what the Gita is asking us to do, not the like, I mean the Yamas, but it's all, it's all connected. It's all connected, my friends. Um, (laughs) Like the Gita is like, look, don't do other people's Dharma. Don't do what you think you should do. It's all about what this part of you is saying. Like if Krishna is like the, the, in the depths of the, in the cave of the heart, you know, or the light inside or whatever, there's a bit in you that always knows what the truth is. And I think all of our practices connect us to that, you know, like even all of our asana even. All the asana practices, yeah, the pranayama yeah. practice, the chanting, everything breaks down all the shoulds and the externals and all the, ca- the baggage that you're carrying around, going back to Aparigraha, the less you carry around other people's baggage, the more you can know what your own truth is. Yeah, but there is something that's very difficult, because I don't even know that, that I would go as far as to say it breaks it down. It certainly shows you it, offers you... It, it shows you it, and then it's like, you can break it down if you want. Yeah, an invitation. Yeah. To for me it breaks it it breaks it down it kind of it's it. you know what it is it's like a pre-wash spray that like you know <laughs> you'd see the adverts for like stains and you put the spray and it see you see like the mo- molecules of the stain like come off your jumper so that's what yoga does is it loosens it a little bit and then you can choose to let it move or not yeah i think the other thing about this one as well it's it sounds really nice and easy to speak your truth, live your truth. Actually, what's really, really hard is knowing what your truth is. Like, what, yeah. what are your values? What are your principles? What is negotiable and non-negotiable? Yeah, exactly. Like, actually... Dis- Can I live with this? Uh, actually kind of uncovering... Exactly. ...what it is that you believe yeah. and you want it's really hard because because once you have that and you see it really clearly it's much easier to stand your ground exactly well it's still quite hard i mean depending on what the circumstances are but, but like this is how easy air I'm it's not easy air yeah, yeah it's easy air but it's like that like you know how we come into or at least i speak for myself you come into the mysore room and like you get halfway through and like suddenly you're crying and you thought you were fine <laughs> like that's satya right there is yeah. things coming to the surface because we in order to survive out there make ourselves numb to what is really in there. I'm like, yeah. I know I definitely of, did that to myself. Armor on. Yeah, exactly. Armor. Or like, you're like, okay, this is how I'm supposed to live. That's how I'm going to live. Mm. And because unless you have a very clear idea about an alternative, it's very hard to go against the stream, you know? And, uh, you know, it depends on how you're brought up. Like you can have an idea about like, you know, this is just how things are done. And if it's never revealed to you, like that there's other alternatives, then you then it you can't even it's like, you know, um in uh Orwell, for example, talks about in uh nineteen eighty four about how if you remove a word for something from a language, then you can't conceptualize it. So and this is why I like Sanskrit words, because they give us another concept. Yeah. They kind of broaden our understanding of yeah. like what things can be broader than their English uh influence. Um, and so, like, if you haven't had an open eye, then you can't see what you could possibly be doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Love that you're, you're quoting other, I don't, sorry. other <laughs> literature and stuff, and I'm like, oh god. It's just what's in my head. I thought about George Orwell since uh, school. I really like George Well, I mean, the thing is that that's something that I'm particularly interested in. And I, and I actually how language think forms are thinking. I did my homework on George Orwell from the cheat notes rather than actually reading the book. Um, because the only other thing I was going to say here, maybe before we move on from Satya, yeah. is um, for me this also talks about, or talks to like the challenges around feeling that we have to fit in, feeling that because exactly. belonging is exactly. a real fundamental human exactly. need. And so but we what pretend are, what to be are we willing people. to compromise to to get that sense of belonging to fit in and kind of like parallel but connected to that is um, the, the whole aspect of people pleasing. Oh yeah, exactly. As well and almost negating your own needs 100%. and prioritising other people. 100%. But again, that, that comes back to like maybe the need to fit in or the need to be yeah, accepted yeah, yeah. or like because we all want to be liked. Um, and when I was thinking about that, it put me in mind of um, there is a therapist called uh, Marie Terrell who's written a book about people pleasing. Mm-hmm. And she actually talks about people pleasing as a manipulative behaviour and I get quite offended by that oh, at first. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah, because I think, did you... I read the book too and it was so, it was offend- really like helpful for me actually. Uh, I got really offended by that at first, but actually... I realised it The too, more yeah. I thought about it, mm-hmm. actually because it's me trying to control the outcome. Exactly. It's me trying to control how people respond exactly. to me. Exactly, because if you control what information people have about you, then you control how they respond to that information and you. Yeah. And so you're then presenting some like other character who's not really your real thing. Yeah, yeah. So when I was thinking about Satya and you know in my, my sort of current um, focus on it, that that was part of it as well. That really spoke to me. It was like, mm. no, I need to be Beautiful. me. Yeah. And because if I'm trying to decide what I want and and what I want to achieve and what my aims are. Mm-hmm. And I want to be clear around that and around that for the business. I need to be really clear about me and I need to be really honest about yeah. me. But don't you feel, Judy, me, that like the me, more... Me, no, but me. really, I, the thing is, you making the joke about me, 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 that's the narrative of like, you shouldn't be selfish or whatever, which isn't really, re- yeah. isn't really true. It's just like people trying to make each other feel bad. But actually, like, I'm sure that you've experienced this. I certainly have. The more I've been myself in like what I do with my work and my my personal whatever, the more you're actually yourself, the more people are actually drawn to you. Yes. I think so. Yes. And there's a really beautiful song by one of my favourites, uh, musical artists, where she has this this word, uh, this phrase where she's like, um, "There's the, you are a conduit, like, and you are the only you as a conduit." There's no one else like you and there's no one else ever before you or ever after you. So if you block who you really are, then the world will never experience that. Absolutely. And the thing is, like, intellectually, I'm all over that. Yeah. We all have our own... But in order to be truthful, you have have to to be vulnerable. You have to actually show who you really are, which feels terrifying. Which is why... (gasps) Yeah. I'm embarrassed to turn up with notes. Uh, No! (laughs) But like, but that's, that's, that's great, that's who you really yes. are. And that's what's yes. wrong with that. You know what I mean? You can do a pinch, I can't. <laughs> Tit for tat, whatever. Um, yeah, so what then? Should, should I do one or? Well, I guess I, you said yours and then... Well, I do my third one then. Yeah, okay, sure. Well, because I picked... Well, it's, when I say my third one, it's actually the second one. So uh-huh. this is the one... I that changed think, so much. I think I might have done the biggest... You turn, mm. on turn, and, and it's, and I think it's going to keep kind of swinging backwards and forwards, mm-hmm. but, but it's um, Svad, Svad, Haya, Svad, Haya, yes, I, mean. <laughs> I like that variation um, of this pronunciation, yeah. So, this one's come a long way, uh huh. Because, what did you think it meant at first? So like, how was it presented my first to you? Meeting with it is in the um. Swami Satchananda that's on mm-hmm. the reading list. Okay. For I never got that one, sorry. Let me stick. Which one did I get? On. I had the Iyengar one at, fun, at first, and James told me not to read yeah. it. Yeah. So, by study of spiritual books comes communion <laughs> with one's chosen deity. Yeah. Spiritual books? <laughs> by study of spiritual books comes communion with one's chosen deity. And I was like, what? What? Yeah. yeah. Really? 
Yeah. Um, but then, like, the more I read around it, the kind of, the more, would we maybe say the more modern interpretation of that? I d- actually, I don't know if it's modern because Richard Freeman talks about this as well. Mm. Um, takes it more into the realm of study of the self and self-awareness. And I was like, oh yeah, right, okay. Yeah. I kinda, that makes heaps more sense yeah. than sitting, so, reading, yeah. fusty, Old yeah. Well, I can interpret that. Text. I mean, I don't know if it's helpful, but like, so, let me go yeah, you circle. do it. Uh huh. So now where I'm at is like, actually, it's both. So it's it's taken me quite a long time to figure out, or or to kind of just extrapolate. You know, James talks a lot about these texts being mirror exactly texts. Yeah. Um, and I was like, yeah, 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 totally get that. That's fine. But actually, I think I I'm starting to get a deeper appreciation of more about what that means because you know every time I visit the text I see something different and I get something different Mm -hmm. something different is meaningful or something different resonates and and that's all grand but now I'm thinking I'm starting to kind of maybe get a a sense of how they both sit together and that the studying of the classic texts isn't just the studying of the classic texts it's studying yourself reflected in and through the lens of yeah, right. those classic exactly. texts. Like what we're doing now. Yeah, but then there's the flip side of that as well. So in that kind of self study, study of the self, the more work you do with the texts, the more that gives you a different lens and different perspective when you're doing the self study part yeah so and vice versa the more better you know yourself the, the more to the text will actually talk to you so actually those two kind of different definitions mm-hmm. feed each other so so they're in this kind of spiral or circle and then in preparation for today i actually went back to to this one and i noticed that i've actually underlined so in the commentary on this one it mm. says regular practice becomes study huh? oh hello so it was there all along <laughs> i just Obviously. didn't get it yeah, yeah. <laughs> just you know it just didn't yeah think. so like i say i picked this one because i felt that it had gone mm-hmm. full circle that that i felt it was a very alien concept and all about fusty dusty old books then it's completely swung the other way and it's all about me again and now i can see it actually it's like them all, there's more depth, um, you know, and there's more mm-hmm. to be explored. Yeah. There. Svajaya is, I mean, Sva is self, and Chaya mm. is like, I mean, focusing on it, I guess. Um, and I mean, you know, I always like texts, um, but I guess, and I like them in a geeky way, but I also like them about the way that I like yoga philosophy, it's not because of the geekiness of it because actually that's not really sustainable only something that's going to be directly relevant to you in your life mm. is going to be sustainable yeah um and uh that's why i like the text because they are like something that i carry with me all the time to reassure me that what i'm doing or like to show me where to go um that's for me what swadhyaya is i guess it's quite simple but it's so important that it's not only in the yamas, it's also in like the, 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 um, the definition of Kriya Yoga at the beginning of chapter two, of like yeah. what even is the practice of yoga? Discipline, self-study and surrender. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think self-study, I mean, you could look at it in a broader way. You could look at it as re- reading texts or you could look at it as like watching how you show up in the, on, on the mat every day yeah. as a self-study. Yeah, and I think for me as well is it's the, even just the, that, that very kind of simplified version of it in, in reading of the text that has broadened out quite a lot because it's it's not just reading of the text it's taking some of what's in there and figuring out how does it apply to you mm-hmm. how can you live by it or bring it into your own life whereas I think like probably with most people like for a lot of years these texts have been something that I don't really feel either physically, literally or metaphorically I carry with me, there's something I go and study and I mm. read and, it, and it's all very 
intellectual mm -hmm. and I underline stuff and I make notes and yeah. all of that. But for me, what's what's happened kind of relatively recently is is more of a sense that I'm kind of metaphorically carrying some yeah. of it with me. And it will pop into my head mm -hmm. sometimes at times where maybe it wouldn't have yeah. Um, yeah. before. And like I say, it's not, I don't use it in my language a lot yeah. when I'm teaching or talking about mm -hmm. yoga or whatever. The thing is but you actually do though, Judy, because you don't have to say the words of Yama Niyama yeah, in order to actually yeah. be doing it. And also like, what's much better is that like, going back to Satya, like for me, you absolutely practice Satya all the time. <laughs> Because you show up in a very authentic... That's why everyone's so drawn to the studio, because it's so no-nonsense. And me too. And like, um, f as far as I've experienced, you've always been, in a respectful way, very honest about everything, always. And that, like, you know, you're doing it. And so you're walking it. Um, so, so maybe what... Maybe for me then, what's, what's happening is I'm starting to be able to make connections between what I think and feel and, and my... And how the and tradition choices, views it, mm -hmm. and and how it's framed up in the tradition, and I'm starting to to be able to to hook those up a little bit. You know what? Don, Donna Fari says that the yama and yama are the natural consequence of practice, which is an interesting perspective, considering yes. that some people view the yama and yama because they come at the beginning of the eightfold, uh, you know, the Ashtanga yeah. yoga kind of practice. Um, so that you are supposed to practice them first as a foundation. Although actually later texts, like the Hatha Yoga texts, start with asana, by the way. Well, yes. with, like You need to start out your body first and then you can start to think about ah, ethics. Because if your body's a mess, you want to then you're not going to be able to. And, and, and also, and well. yeah, I find that asana actually gives me the resilience to yes. practice the Yama Niyama. Because yes. you, you need to be, like we said about Satya, and actually all of them, you have to be courageous. You have to be able to <gasps> sit with discomfort in order to Absolutely. do it. And so... Um, I definitely think I think that it's a mutually like uh, influential thing that I don't think that you should just sit around and wait for them to happen on their own. You definitely have to no. practice it. However, um, we, you don't have to beat yourself up and be like, "I'm gonna perfectly sit and diligently do my satya." I mean, because it actually is gonna happen if you show up on the yoga mat with an open heart, satya and compassion for yourself, uh, uh, ahinsa. Then the svadhyaya, for example. Is gonna is gonna arise, and yeah, the other and, ones and you're too. there with honesty and respect and, um, and recognizing yeah. a paragraha not trying to grasp, but the uh, achieving the postures yeah. necessarily. Yeah. Cool. God, I love it when it all ties it up. It does tie up. So, what's your last one? Well, I've got two more actually. Oh, have you? <laughs> oh, that's sorry, cause that was your first one. Yeah, yeah, oh, I know. Oh, you should have gone next then instead of me. It's okay. Um, grabbing the line. So light that's okay. Usually. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. It's yours you to go do. too. <laughs> um, so I, the next one I wanted to talk about is one also that's changed for me recently, very recently, which is Brahmacharya. And the oh. other reason I know, right? Oh, so exactly. So the other reason I wanted to talk about it in this is because it, everyone hates Brahmacharya because it's like it says you shouldn't have sex, um, and. So what James says about it, James Bogue, peace, um, uh, is what James says about it is that if nobody ever had sex, then humanity wouldn't continue. And at the very beginning, right before all the yamas are listed, Patanjali says, this is the Mahavrata, this is the great vow that applies to all humans everywhere, no matter what place, time, or lo like yeah, location, it's yeah. everyone. So if everyone did Brahmacharya and didn't have sex, then humanity would die. So that's clearly not what it means. That's what he says. Other people always translate it as celibacy. Some people translate it to say that it's like a sexual um, responsibility and respect. And like all of that is true for sure. But mm -hmm. like I, I have a new feeling about it lately okay. for me, um, which is this. We, we walk around the world when we're not sure in ourselves and look outwardly for comfort and solutions and other things like that mm. and one of the ways that I know that I have like uh you know disconnected from my own trying to meet my own needs and trying to be self-reliant and things like that is codependent relationships okay. which is really unhealthy and for me brahmacharya so as I've and it's taken me a lot of like work to try and like turn it around and feel like I can hold my own space right mm -hmm. and that is that's tapas you know that's actually svadhyaya that's as that's asteya that's a pergraha that's ahinsa that's all of it yeah. actually 
at Santosha, which is my other one. But Brahmacharya for me then is. And so basically when I started to practice this, I started to feel a great sense of spiritual connection even more. That when you're not looking outwards to other relationships for meeting your emotional spiritual needs, there starts to be a sense of containment mm -hmm. because we have to, uh, you can admit that, like, I mean, you can see divinity out there if you can like hone your eye, but the easiest place, because consciousness is inside us, the easiest place to make contact with divinity or however you want to call it is if you go inwards. Mm -hmm. And so if you're always relying on other sorts of energetic relationships, sexual relationships or anything else on other people. If you're waiting for someone else to save you, it's never going to happen. And so for me, Brahmacharya now, so the word Brahma is like, uh, you know, it's one of the, um, uh, like the ways that divinity is kind of personified in the Indian tradition. And then Charya is walking. So it's walking with God. Yeah. And so the only way that you're going to be able to walk the spiritual path is not necessarily alone, but being able to be with your own experience of being in this human life. So that is my feeling about Brahmacharya lately. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Yeah, and that's actually a really lovely way to think about it. And it's it just makes me think about, you know, all of the the relationship advice that is essentially you've got to love yourself first. As RuPaul says, or, if you can't love yourself, how yeah. the hell are you going to love anyone else? Well, exactly. Amen. You know, and if you don't love yourself, no one else is going to love you. You're not going to have healthy boundaries. You're looking, boundaries. You're, you're going, going to be people pleasing. You're going to be looking for something from other people that they're not in the best position. To yeah. No matter how wonderful yeah. they are, yeah. they're, they're not in the best position to give you. And I think for me, the other thing about Ramacharya is it's, it, it is very context Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So originally it was designed yeah. for like Indian boys so that they wouldn't run around chasing girls and they yeah. would sit and study in school. At, at a certain stage, having made certain life choices yeah. and having been born into certain caste or family right, exactly. responsibilities. And, and so from that point of view, it is very context driven. Mm -hmm. But so many of the teachers in the text now talk about family and house, you know, seven series. Yeah. And, and so it can't it can't possibly only mean so that exactly. with a certain context absolutely mm -hmm. that may well yeah. be the meaning but it, it can't it can't be the only exactly and only i think meaning. that i think that what's helpful so brahmacharya as well controversially some people say like it's all about not taking not eating all the cookies in the packet and i'm like come on so i think that you everyone has to look at it personally mm. And this is the true of all the yama niyama and actually all yoga teachings ever because yoga is a study of yourself with a capital small s or a capital s you have to look at like where for you is the sticky point mm -hmm. so like for me i it's not so hard to like not sleep around and things like that like that's not something that i have all ever been like you know compelled to do necessarily um however codependent relationships is a thing that is my sticky point for example mm -hmm. and so I'm like how can I find a way to not not that I tell myself not to do it I find the resilience in myself and the depth and the richness in myself so that I'm not even compelled to do that well that's the because that's the reframe isn't it and it's that's the thing about the whole non this non that non mm -hmm. the next thing it's all very negative yeah but if we can reframe that into well what does that mean we do what are we what looking to we do, cultivate exactly. what are we looking to foster so that's exactly what you're talking about there it's mm. like you're not looking to not do all of that stuff yeah exactly not be yeah, yeah, yeah 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 you're looking to foster the good stuff in you mm -hmm. so that you don't need yeah that codependent relationship exactly. anymore yes exactly yeah, yeah. so that's mm. what i'm thinking i was going to say that's a juicy one but Isn't maybe it? that's not the right um, oh, I don't analogy. know. That's it. I mean, I like that's. I feel that that's how that's how it is. And the the last one that I chose is connected to that santosha, um, okay. which is contentment. Which it's so it comes from the verbal root dush, which means to enjoy. Yeah, I and nearly, relish. I nearly chose this one. Yeah, because it was the kind of other one that made a little bit of sense. Yeah, at the beginning. On first. Yeah, I think so. A lot it. of people like it when they first. Yeah. Um, but. I've had a journey with Santosha actually because I 
always told myself like you know you know you write gratitude lists and you're like make be content with what you have yes and crucially for me santosha so it comes from this verbal root, root tush, which is enjoy which is a joyful and full and sincere and honest satya type of emotion which cannot be compelled you can't enjoy your life you can't force yourself to enjoy yourself and enjoy your life right and yeah. sun the prefix sun is like completeness so the complete enjoyment of yourself which means that santosha actually is asking you to make your life something that you can be happy with which means that you are not only being like, oh, well, I'm going to like and lump it. You make the choices. You are courageous enough to do the choices and make, um, can I live with this? Is this something that, is this mm. the life that I want to be? And lately, I've been like the last week or so, I've been sitting around in the evenings or like this morning I did it in the park and I go, what's wrong with this? Not a damn thing, you no. know? And like, I'm like, I'm, things are always moving, but where I'm at right now, I'm, feeling more than for a long time, a sense of that santosha, that, that kind of ability to enjoy the richness of just the sim simple moment of like, you know, the burgeoning ripeness of the trees or like my cute dog lying on the sofa in the morning or like enjoying a little glass of white wine in the, in the, in the evening or sitting on the sofa is a big part of it. <laughs> <laughs> like I do, like I'm like, oh god, at least I can yeah, sit down yeah. for one moment. But no, but like honestly, a lot of things in my life are now like my job and like my two jobs. I really like I like all the things. But the only it only arose because I made the extremely hard work to make it happen. Absolutely. And it's not going to stay because everything's changing. No, constantly. So I need to be constantly in an alive and responsive way, engaging with life to make it always something that I can enjoy fully. Yes. Um, and that is again also like a change that happened because like I say I grew up with this like very Scottish thing which is like you know mend and make do mm -hmm. which is also a very like it's it's a good thing to have in your that has value it definitely that, has value that, but accept, you shouldn't block it and you shouldn't be able to block your joy because you then are. you're just going to block other people's joy yeah. and you're not going to show up for who you really are in this life and, and there's something in there as well about you know if you're showing up as yourself if you feel sad or grumpy or like without joy, you have to feel able to show up as that person. That's your Santa. And yeah. also, how is your Ahinsa going to be if you're in a horrible mood all the time? It's going to be uh -huh. really hard to actually practice that. Yeah, but the contentment thing for me was it, like on the surface, it seems like really nice and fine. And like you see the gratitude diaries and the well, I should be happy. I should. I this. should be happy. Uh, but I think once you start scratching under the surface mm -hmm. of it a little bit, and obviously, like with everything else, like all the other stuff we've spoken about, there's something for me about it that Santosha arises from the other stuff. Mm. It's not something mm. that you can go out and look for mm. and deliberately cultivate. It arises from everything yeah, else so. that you're doing and all of a sudden you have a moment where yeah. you're like if this is as good as it gets that's pretty damn good yeah. you know it's, it's it's that same time and then it passes again and you're caught up in the i should be doing this mm -hmm. i should be doing that or i'm feeling sad or angry or yeah. you know and and, and so it, it's almost like a a fountain or something that just keeps bubbling up and sometimes you notice when it happens and sometimes yeah. you don't all of these things it's really a cyclical motion because it's the same way that with the practice you come back again and again you show up every day on your mat or as often as you can you with the meditation practice you come back to your focus again and again and in the same way you come back to like you'll have days when you absolutely can't feel content with anything and you're really annoyed because no, you didn't and, sleep enough and or whatever nor, sh nor should you feel content that there are circumstances where that you know that are absolutely unacceptable that's the other thing because if you do thank you for mentioning that because that's something i'm really interested in is how uh santosha can be a nice blanket which becomes spiritual bypassing yes of like everything is perfect and beautiful i'm happy in the world but actually no there's plenty of stuff out there 
um, like the um, plenty of stuff. There's like constant the social injustice, racism, yes. sexism, political upheaval, horrible treatment of humanity, and you know all of that stuff. And so you cannot just be like, well, I'm just going to enjoy my life and that's fine. So this is the thing that it's you have to do the satya of showing up and actually seeing what is really true, and then acting, acting, exactly. action, and yeah, I there, there's something about it, isn't there that even though there are definitely things happening and will continue to happen that are completely unacceptable. That doesn't preclude you from finding Santosha mm-hmm. or yeah. for it arising if you feel that you've done everything that you can, that you're taking moment action, by moment, skillful yeah. action or yeah. whatever we want to, to call it. Exactly. Um, and that you're not just burying your head in the sand or exactly. hiding or numbing or exactly. ignoring. I feel like or... with that stuff, because I get upset about, you know, large scale injustice a lot. Um, and now, um, because I'm trying to dedicate myself to making a slight impact somehow, one way or another, moment by, I, f- I feel that like at least moment by moment, if I'm showing up and doing what I can in a small way, we're moving forward, or at least I'm moving forward, like something is moving. Because the thing is, you could like, you could be like, oh, it's such a, I can't, no, one person can't make a difference, and then yeah, you drop I, your hands, and you absolutely are like, giving up your responsibility. And like, what if everyone did that, then yeah, nothing would happen? But, can, but if everyone yeah, raised arms, then we would all be yeah, able to I mean, do and things. And you can, I can totally understand why people are like, well, that is so Because it's disheartening. What can I possibly do about it? And the way it's all reported, it's very disempowering. Yeah. Um, for they the do that on purpose. <laughs> yeah, which yeah. is a whole conversation yeah, for another day. Um, and so I completely understand that. And I know when I get really upset and, and feel powerless about it, I just I have to very deliberately bring it back to, well, what can I do? Yeah. What well, can I do know, today... Just now. We talked about this last week in the karma when we were in the philosophy club and about how, you know, we have to, you can acknowledge that like every single time you literally do anything, you have a ripple effect to everyone around you. And we talked about just the, the simple effect of like going to a yoga class, you come home and you're kinder to the people in your family mm-hmm. and then ha- they will be more predisposed to be kinder to whatever, right? And so there's these little ripple effects. So karma teaches us then that we can absolutely make a difference. If we make one tiny little step, there are always every single action has a reaction, mm-hmm. and so or an inf- or an impact, and so the tiniest little impact is going to move, you know, move forward and make ripples. You don't even know what they are, and that's the entire teaching of the Bhagavad Gita. You don't know the big picture. You have to do the thing that feels right in your heart at this moment, and trust that it's going to make an impact. And the things you don't have to take it on blind faith because the the cause and effect. Which is a very, you can see it, like if I drop something, it will fall. You know, mm. cause and effect is, you can't deny it. And so you, you can trust in that kind of, uh, you know, law of physics of the world that like any, any small thing is going to make a difference in some way. So yeah. that's why Ahinsa, just to like add another one in there, but we've <laughs> talked about Ahinsa the whole time. Uh, well, that's it, why it, Ahinsa it is not about just being like, oh, love and light, you know, I'm compassionate to people. It's why... Uh, you know, the, the, the teachings actually encourage us to trust the fact that we can make a difference and we can bring about harmony. We can fight against harm. We can make the world a better place. Because even a tiny bit better, it's still better. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I think we better stop there. Yeah. I was about to loop it back to Satya again there. Oh, well. But... We could. I mean, Both. this is it, yeah. Because it can just it can go on and on, and I think we've probably got about another twenty oh, yeah. chai sessions. Right. <laughs> well, well, why we don't I say about how we're going to look at this? Um, yeah. So I was going to say so. Emma is running a Yama Niyama course. Yeah. Here. So do you want to say a little bit about what you're going to do and how you're going to approach it? And yeah. Maybe what people can expect. A hundred percent. So uh-huh. what we'll do is Not we'll, just blathering on like we did. Well, I mean, what's <laughs> nice is that, I mean, we obviously have, we're quite immersed in it and what we have is like a personal experience of it that we're sharing here. And what I, we like to do that when I have these philosophy clubs is like, everyone bringing their unique perspective because then we see more sides of the diamond because mm. everyone you know if you think about Satya everyone has a limited view mm-hmm. you know because of our avidya our, our lack of insight 
Um, and so the more we pr uh, combine our perspectives, the more we can actually learn from each other, which is really nice. But so we're going to look at like, there'll be a very brief, like, what does it really mean? Or like, what was it intended? Mm -hmm. But then it's more about like, how can we actually bring this in now? And so we'll have like questions or uh, like prompts for each one, which we can then take away and look at and be like, well, how am I showing up with this? So that it's like, it's like we have our jewel set, we can take each one out and look at it for a minute and then put it back again mm -hmm. so that like it reveals something to us um, about, about who we are and how we're living. Um, and so we only have six hours, which is again a short time, but um, even in that time, we're going to cover the, all ten yama and yama and s notice how they inter interact with each other and uh, about how, what they can teach us about asana, daily life, relationships, relationship with ourself and basically everything. Yeah, so uh, people don't have to have any sort of background in order yeah, to come to Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So yeah. it sounds to me then like they're, you know, even if someone ha has never really studied yama and yama or, or tried to do anything with them, they maybe just got a vague notion of them. Yeah. They, they I mean, can come along yeah. as well as, I'm like, because I know, I know what it's like, I feel like I don't want to speak up when I don't know much. Yeah. Or if somebody says, what do you think about that? I'm kind of like... Well, it's like the, yeah, blank. you don't have so. to, like we've had this with the philosophy club where people have come where they didn't have any, any sort of background at all in mm. studying anything. And if, as long as you have a human life and, and are willing to look at your own human life, then, I mean, you don't have to like go and do like deep dives, but just like to kind of think, oh, well, what do I think about that? You know, just that yeah. is enough. And it's not really lecture based, is it? It's, it's not, not like it's like this kind of, uh -huh. yeah. I mean, I'll have a handout and I'll kind of present the information that you need mm -hmm. so that like you don't have to have read anything. What I always say is that you won't, don't have to have read before, but afterwards you might want to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then we can talk about what is helpful to read and like which books are good. <laughs> if you want to study some text. Yeah. I mean, this one, my favorite, I obviously took the biggest one because I have to show yeah, off for that. Yeah, show off. Like. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know quantity, human right. language numbers. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of are always match each other, right? That's yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Emma, thank you no, so yeah. much. We'll I loved it. We'll put the details of the course mm -hmm. um, into the email and, the yeah. and, yeah. and whatnot. And the, if you want to join, if you've got any interest at all, please do join Emma. It's definitely, definitely worth it. Mm -hmm. Emma, thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Cheers. <laughs> I finished my tea. I did. Why are we doing Thank you so much for listening to our specially extended chai session. If you'd like to join Emma for her Yama Niyama course, it runs three consecutive Sundays from Sunday the 11th of June, 3 to 5 p.m. And you can find all the details and the link to book on the workshop page at merchantcityyoga.com. You can even book for individual sessions, but we ask that you note that there's no clear split between the content of each session.